In this video, we're going to do another example of solving for a flow using the Navier-Stokes equations. This type of flow is called a couette flow. What is a couette flow? Here's an overview. Now we're going to change our coordinate system a little bit compared to the last example. Now we're going to move our origin down to the bottom wall. We still have an XY coordinate system. It's still going to be a two-dimensional problem. And we have solid walls at y equals 0 and at y equals b. Except in this case, there is no pressure gradient. There is no, the pressure is constant everywhere in this flow. And now we're driving the flow by applying a velocity on this top wall. So this wall is moving with a velocity v, and we want to solve for the fully developed flow, not pressure driven. Uh, let's say our thing before, this is not pressure driven. For the fully developed flow between parallel plates, that's driven by applying a force to the top plate, which results in a velocity on that top plate. We will again have the no-slip condition, but the no-slip condition is slightly different now. It's still the no-slip condition. The bottom wall is not moving, and so u at the bottom wall and v at the bottom wall are zero, but the top wall is moving in the x direction with a velocity v. And so the no-slip condition means that at x equals at y equals b, the u velocity has to match that and be v. The v velocity is still zero because it's not moving in that direction. So this is still the no-slip condition, but now it means that the velocity at the top surface has the value v. We are going to neglect body forces this time, and that means that we're saying the acceleration due to gravity is zero. And there is no pressure gradient in the flow. The pressure is constant. So our governing equations again are our Navier-Stokes equations in principle, three dimensions, x, y, z component of momentum and our conservation of mass equation, and in the derivation of the momentum equations, we had assumed constant viscosity, constant density, and uh, stress-strain rate relationship for a Newtonian fluid. Let's reduce these equations to the ones, to the simplified form that will give us the case that we're looking for here of Couette flow. Again, let's start with our assumptions. We'll take that list that's there from the starting point with the equations that we're using. We have a constant viscosity, we have an incompressible flow or a constant density flow. Our fluid is Newtonian. It is a two-dimensional problem. We're going to assume that it's steady. There are no changes in time. It's fully developed. The velocity is not changing in the flow direction or in the x direction in this case. And the velocity matches the wall velocity. The no-slip condition is enforced. And we're going to neglect any body forces. The gravitational forces in our V-pigs will be neglected. So, as with the previous example, steady flow enables us to cancel out all of the time derivatives. The fact that it's two-dimensional means that we can cancel out all of the variation with respect to z, and of course we saw last time that means the entire z-momentum equation and the z-variations. So there we are down to this point with our two-dimensional. Okay, fully developed, as with last time, that means that the velocity a gradient in the x direction, the velocity is not changing in the x direction, so that term is zero. And if du dx is zero, then dv dy is zero. So this term is zero, that means dv dy, dv dy is zero. And if dv dy is zero, again, we have the v velocity is zero on this surface, there's no change in y, and so the v velocity is everywhere zero. And that means we can cancel out this term that's multiplied by v, and this term that is the v variation in x, where v is everywhere zero. So again in this flow, we see that we have the inertia force term is the inertia force term has every single term and it is cancelled out, and we're going to be reduced to a force balance again. And we have a couple of terms left. Oops, some we haven't gotten rid of. Our v terms and our d e u dx because of the fully developed. There we go. So we're left with a force balance, and when we neglect body forces, we have the viscous terms and the pressure terms and more to cancel out. So, as with last time, let's look at our y momentum because the body forces were being neglected. The body forces being neglected means we cancel out these terms. We said that there was no pressure vari variation in the x direction, the pressure was constant. And so when we get to our y momentum equation, of course, that's all we get from the y mo momentum equation. We didn't cancel out that dp dy. We probably could have because we said the pressure was constant. 
But nonetheless, we see that's the case. dp dy is equal to zero. When we integrate that, the pressure is equal to a constant, and that's all we get from the y-momentum equation. In the x-momentum equation, the terms we had left, the inertia term had gone, the body force term, or the gravitational term, uh, had cancelled out, and all but this term had cancelled out in the viscous force. So we get mu dtu dy squared is equal to zero. Our only variation is in the y direction, and so we can use d instead of the partial derivative, and say the second derivative u with respect to y is equal to zero. We can integrate that twice. Integrate it first once, du dy is equal to a constant, or u is equal to constant 1y plus constant 2. Now, as before, we're going to use our boundary conditions in order to solve for these constants. We know at the bottom surface, the u component of velocity is equal to zero. And so, if u is equal to zero and y is equal to zero, right away we see c2 has to be zero. Zero equals zero plus zero. c2 is zero. And we use our second boundary condition, u at x, u for any x at b, this surface, the u component of the velocity has to match this velocity is equal to v. And from that, we can solve for c1. So, at that surface, u is equal to v. c1 times b, we're at a location y is equal to b. And so, c1 is equal to v over b, which we can substitute back into our velocity equation and solve for our velocity profile. And we see that u is equal to v over b y. Now it's linear in y. v is the known velocity of this plate that's given as a boundary condition. b is the dimension of our channel, and y is our coordinate direction. It's linear, and we see we're going to have a velocity profile that goes from 0 at the bottom wall up to v at the top wall. And that will be our velocity profile. We can again look at the shear stress. Again, the definition of a Newtonian fluid, simplified along with the, all of these other assumptions that led us to this point. The shear stress on a y face in the x direction is equal to mu du dy, taking the derivative of our velocity profile, which was v over b times y, the derivative is v over b, we see that the shear stress is mu v over b. v is this constant velocity in the boundary condition, v is the channel dimension, mu is the viscosity of our fluid, and we see that that is now a constant value. So if I were to draw the shear stress, it is a constant value. There is no variation. And of course, that makes a considerable amount of sense. If I were to think about a control volume that was, say, this big, I need to have a shear stress, which balance this velocity to pull this means that we have an applied force here. And that force over the wall area the wall area that we would have there is equal to a shear stress. And that shear stress, of course, has to be balanced. And again, we can look at the signs and make sure that we have that the right way. This surface has a normal in the negative y direction, and therefore a positive direction for a shear stress on this y face acting in the x direction is going to be in the negative coordinate direction. And so we have tau y axis, a positive tau y axis in that direction, and in fact it will balance that applied stress. And it doesn't matter if we make the control volume this big, that stress has to be exactly the same. This force hasn't changed, we have to see it's the same value in order to balance it, and therefore the shear stress is a constant. No matter where we draw our volume, it has to balance the applied force. And for interest's sake, this is one method we could use to measure the viscosity of a fluid. If we pull this plate to a known velocity and measure the force with which we pull on that, and we know the dimensions of this channel, then we've measured the tau y x, we've set the velocity, we've determined tau y x for a given velocity, we know our channel dimension, and therefore we can solve for the viscosity, and this would be a simple viscometry. So that's Couette flow, and I wanted to very quickly compare this to the stress profile in Poisson flow. You remember, in Poisson flow, when we had a pressure-driven flow, so in Poisson flow, we had a P1 that was, was greater than P2, and so we have parabolic velocity profile that we solved for in the previous video. 
And we saw that we had a shear stress distribution that was linear to yx, as compared to this case where we have a constant shear stress. And of course, the reason for this is both of these problems um, come down to a force balance. In the Couette flow that we just solved for in this video, the stress in the fluid has to balance the applied stress, or the stress that's applied from the applied force on our control volume, and that's a constant, and so therefore we have a constant shear stress. In the case of the Poisson flow, where it's a pressure-driven flow, if I draw two different sized control volumes like I did in the previous slide, if I draw this control volume here, pressure one is acting over, I guess pressure one is bigger than pressure two, pressure one is acting over this area here, and that will result in a certain force that has to be balanced by the shear stress that we have on this surface up here and this surface down here. If I instead drew a smaller control volume, I would have the same pressure, P1 and P2, but now my area is smaller, and so this shear stress that I have here at this location would have to be smaller than the shear stress that I had here. And so you can see that as I change the size of this, it's going to vary linearly with the size, and the shear stress has to balance it, and so we have to have a linear variation in the shear stress to balance it in the Poisson flow, or the pressure-driven flow, compared to the constant value that we have to have in the Couette flow. That concludes our example for the Couette flow.